So stand up now and then you can come right here. I just want to say thank you. It was super. It was super. Yeah, that's the idea. Oh, that was so cool. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. It's a reaction. I have I All right, it's been a real, a real marathon, and we're gonna finish up here before our banquet at 7 p.m. And we're we're not on our our written schedule, but we're you know time-wise we're doing okay. And our final presentation for the day will be from David Albert Westbrook, known as Bert, who is a he's a professor at law at uh, SUNY Buffalo Law School in. New York State. Uh, he's an all-around Renaissance man that of uh, many talents and many, many interests. His books are, are varied. They've covered issues of finance, uh, global capitalism, security, anthropology, and his latest book, which I believe will be coming out next year, is okay. Arguably next year it'll be coming out is on drum roll, please. The, the topic of country music, so, and sort of. Uh, country music is a metaphor for the American condition. So I'm very much looking forward to that, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from Bert, and the topic of, it, or the title of his speech is Beyond the State, Hegemony, and Decadence. So Bert Westbrook. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, the few, the proud, the people who are still here. Um, uh, I, uh, I usually speak extemp, and I'm probably a little too formal here, but I'm actually going to read a little bit. Very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to read in the interest of clarity. This is actually sort of some of my current thinking, probably encapsulating a lot. I'm going to try to be brief. It's been a fascinating day, a bit of a long day. So I, however, should warn you that I fail at being brief. <laughs> so I hope you're comfortable. You deserve this. Um, I want to sketch three moments, three movements in thought, or more vaguely in a complex of ideas, centered around the concept of the state. Or, as the Germans might put it, I want to trace the wanderings of the zeitgeist as it imagines what it is to do politics. 
I'm going to be focused on the North Atlantic, uh, the EU and the US especially. Uh, the picture is different in other places, of course, which is why we have Weiss. I should also say it's a great honor to be speaking at the Golden Jubilee. Weiss was founded in 1965, the year of my birth, and a year before the Super Bowl. So I feel a certain kind of kinship here. But in my remarks today, I'm only going to go back a long generation to the early 90s. Maybe you remember the early 90s. The Cold War ended. Berlin Wall fell in 1989. Soviet Union dissolved in 1991. People talked about the end of history, by which Fukuyama meant not the end of events, but the hegemony of a certain idea of liberal modernity. Intertwined with the end of the Cold War was the emergence, or perhaps the fashionability, of something called globalization. Conferences were held and books were written, and I, too, was guilty of this. There was even a WISE conference right here on globalizations, as we heard in the last presentation. Now, globalization meant a lot of things at the time, but one of the things it meant was that the state, both as a form of political organization and as a nation, the governance of a distinct place, Spain or South Africa or what have you, didn't mean as much as it once did. Tim was talking about, uh, as Anthony was talking about. Goods, people, information, and especially money could move as never before, and so specific places were less important. By extension, the governments of such places, nation states, were less important. So there was even wild-eyed talk about the end of the state, that history had somehow moved beyond this nation state that had dominated social life, at least in the heart of Europe, for centuries. And considering that the state had been the vehicle for episodic genocide and perennial subjugation, many people thought the decline of the state to be a promising development. And nowhere was this sense of a seismic shift in the nature of political life itself more strongly sensed or more loudly welcomed than in Europe. Recall that the European project, going back to its establishment by the Rome treaties, grew out of concern for the horrors wrought by modern states, especially Germany. This, incidentally, is my first book. In 1992, the Maastricht Treaty creating the European Union was signed. So suddenly the European project seemed close to some sort of definitive fruition, resulting in what Jacques Delors, then president of the commission, once dubbed an unidentified political object. The shape of this project, however, stubbornly remained vague. Treaties, ECJ decisions, <coughs> countless talk gave rise to more and more Europe, but not much clarity, that silly enlightenment virtue. It was widely said at the time that Europe was sui generis. Even then, as a young student, I thought that sui generis was a little unsatisfying by way of political understanding. Even if there's only one of them, can we say what makes this UPO new? Be that as it may, on both the global and European level, there was a sense of more than ordinary historical change, a sense that the nature of politics itself was being transformed from the national in particular to the global and integrated network, systemic, and things like that. From German to European, to take an especially important and not exactly accidental instance. Or to put it differently, and it was often said at the time, the world seemed to be moving in sundry areas of life from a style understood as modern to something struggling to be born, the not yet positively named that was therefore merely called postmodern. Whatever that might in due course reveal itself to be. So that seemed to be the state of play in its broad swaths of intellectual life at the end of the 1990s. And then things started happening. Most dramatically, the 9-11 attacks thrust the United States into what was almost immediately called the global war on terror. Integration might be nice, but there's really nothing like a large nation state to wage large-scale ideological conflict. Note that not only was the US back, government back in the spotlight as a central and very national political actor, Ideological conflict, supposedly buried with the fall of Berlin Wall, was back with a vengeance and is with us still. In Europe, the, conference, the concept of the state resurfaced more subtly, but perhaps even more decisively. In 1999, the euro was established as a single currency for many states comprising the eurozone. The euro was conducted by the Euro European Banking Policy, uh, Monetary Policy was conducted by the European Central Bank, based in Frankfurt. And in order to join the currency, member states were obliged by treaty to harmonize their economies. So we, see the pro so we see a project of widespread conformity in order to create a unified space administered by a highly bureaucratic central authority. Sounds sort of familiar, much like the history of France. Things get more interesting still. In 2008, financial issues in the United States spin out of control. A global financial crisis, also called the Great Recession, ensued. 
It was very good for me professionally. Responding to the crisis, the U.S. government nationalized or forcibly transferred huge institutions. Printing money is necessary. Other governments around the world did much the same thing. Here again, the state seemed not irrelevant, but suddenly indispensable to making globalization work. In Europe, Dexia and Fortis, which were banks that had been encouraged to do business across member states, suddenly found themselves on the brink of insolvency. There was, at the time, no European process to resolve such banks, and so the banks turned to their national governments. Spending taxpayer money, the national governments rescued the bank operations within their own borders. I was flown to the commission to discuss what this meant. At least to some, this train of events casts an odd light on the European project. When times are good, we talk about integration. But when the chips are down, the Europeans turn back to their states. And we've heard variations of this claim ever since, especially with regard to the Greek crisis. Which is not to say that the European project didn't and doesn't have its supporters. Supporters such as my acquaintance Nicholas Ferran, or Phil or Weiss or Angel, and I'm calling that to bother John Vinas, strenuously argued that the problem was that Europe didn't have a true banking union with the resources to resolve banking crises at the European level. Europe has since established such a union, but a more general lesson emerges. emerges. The problems within the Eurozone should be addressed by more intense processes of European integration. Now, for present purposes at least, this may in fact be the case. It's not my point here. What I want to emphasize, however, is that more Europe means, in effect, shifting legal and regular authority to the European plane, shades of the New Deal in the United States. Whether or not that's the right thing to do, the political imagination at work seems to be fundamentally national. That is, what is strongly implied by supporters of the European project at this juncture is another continental state. That is, the state seems to be the horizon for a constitutional thought. So the state is hegemonic in the sense of authoritatively shaping how we seem to be able to think about serious politics. That is, I'm rather unhappily making a kind of end of history argument of my own. For a while, the 90s, we promised ourselves a new kind of politics, but it didn't really happen, despite my books to that effect. So if the first wave I wanted to talk about was anticipation of something beyond the state, running through the 90s, the next decade saw the resurgence of the state as the fundamental form of political, at least institutional thought, a kind of hegemon uh, hegemony over the imagination. So this creates a rather unpleasant paradox. On the one hand, the state is passé. On the other hand, the state evidently cannot be passed. It bears remembering that globalization and integration across politics didn't go away. Weakness in China just appears to have motivated the US Federal Reserve to keep interest rates low, and so forth. And for my own purposes, at least for the purposes of political philosophy, if not institutional construction, I stand by my own articulation of global capitalism as a form of political life, which I call the city of gold. But the city seems to work by changing the meanings of older institutional forms rather than creating new forms of institutional life. This contradiction, an understanding of the state which is not generally credible, plausible, but which is also necessary, has led to a kind of decadence, a sort of false consciousness. We think and speak in a Republican vocabulary, but the grammar, the internal logic is gone. We don't really believe our stories, not even as metaphors. So, to give a better sense of what I mean, let me suggest three areas in which the modern state's decadence is advanced. First, and most obviously, consider electoral politics in the United States. The, the democratic ideal, Bush v. Clinton in a battle of the brands stretching across generations, has been upended by the current circus of Republican candidates. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court has insisted that spending money pretty much is the core of democratic discourse, even over the objections of the literature. And the media, for its part, needs to feed a 24-hour news cycle. Fortunately, politics can be treated like sports, and it's almost as engrossing as football. We don't talk about issues. See, I really am akin to this Super Bowl thing. We don't talk about issues nearly so much as we talk about advantage. And like fantasy football, that talk can be extended indefinitely. How long have we been in this presidential election? At some point, all of this becomes simply unserious, not in terms of people's lives. Do we go to war, raise interest rates, or what have you, remain serious issues, but in terms of a project of collective self-governance. So I'm trying to make my peace with that personally. The US is the third largest nation on the planet, fourth if we treat the EU as a single country. 
And Rousseau taught us to be skeptical of the idea that large groups of people could reach rational consensus or even fellow feeling. Where the US has chosen celebrity, the EU has chosen bureaucracy as the key modality of post-enlightened political life. So a number of countries simply reject the somewhat nationalist idea of a European con constitution. No problem. We will simply renegotiate the substance of the constitution as the Lisbon Treaty, decided among professionals and virtually unreadable. In Europe, the enlightened idea of politics has not been subverted by some reversion to the pre-modern, a return of the repressed, as was long feared. Maybe in Serbia. Nor has it been subverted by carnival, as in the United States. Instead, we get just the opposite, the extension of texts, endless texts, until nobody knows. And rationality, at least publicly accessible rationality, is no longer on the table. So politics, in the narrow sense of official governance, is the first area in which we easily observe what I'm calling the decadence of the enlightened, democratic, republican, modern, and yet nonetheless indispensable state. The second, but perhaps even more important to this group, area of life that I would say suffers from the decadence of the state would be the university, understood as an ideal. In the countries where the modern university was founded, the nation framed the deep structure of elite imaginations, and in so doing, made a certain kind of liberal education, which most of us here enjoy and by extension politics, and by extension law, thinkable. Study the classics and administer India, I like to quip. But the point was that an ideal of the English gentleman, or the German or the American, underwrote what used to be called liberal education. That set of understandings, what sort of leading citizens does a particular society need, and how do we build such citizens, has waned. It no longer gives the bureaucratic in in university operating in a global frame, its sense of purpose, of meaning. We certainly don't look at the university as transmitting any specific culture. That would be elitist, parochial, and generally politically unsound. Indeed, we, and I'm guilty here too, engage in a global competition for paying students. We call it internationalism. Which makes education substantively unimaginable, at least to our administrators, who are less speaking of excellence which is defined in terms of competitive comparison, which must be thought to contribute to brand, that is, the intellectual equivalent of widgets. Leotard saw this coming back in the 70s when he discussed the fate of the university in postmodern, meaning post-national, among other things, terms. So here's a third area of decadence. In a world where law equals the nation, where law flowed from the idea of the nation, one could idealistically, even radically, going back to the evolution, to the effort to outlaw prior to World War I and, and then after World War I, speak of law among nations, or law even against the nation, the subject and the object of public international law, which I also teach. Law in this world could be an idealistic project, ending wars, redeeming history, and maybe even a rather silly substitute for religion, also called human rights. That is, for international law, the state was the problem. And there was much talk for 100 years of war, or war of getting beyond it, getting somehow beyond Westphalia, world government, citizens of the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But such talk took place, mostly unselfconsciously, in an imaginary political life that was itself profoundly republican. So the international law project, envisioned in a world of united nations, stress on nations, could be expanded with a kind of tractable difficulty that lawyers like myself love to include international organizations, international human rights, respect for peoples and trade of goods. Indeed, at least under these conditions of globalization after World War II, consider the United Nations and the GATT and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights all passed at the same time. Perhaps the domain of international law had to be expanded, ultimately producing a map of human relations on the planet. The focus sort of just done again. But it's also a map of nothing. The affrontery of it all. 132 members of the International Law Association claim to speak for the planet, along with a handful of judges deciding a few cases a year. Meanwhile, in the academy and elsewhere, public international law is viewed as marginal, but in a nice way, like bird watching. <laughs> but it gets worse. The map appears to lie quite a bit. Right? Ideas that are very common in international law that start with equality are very rare in the world. And so in the US and other countries, we've routinized assassination, for example. Doesn't really fit in that whole human rights thing, but what the hell? 
Is that not our law too? Mass migrations. History on the march as we bookishly recite the various rights of what to do with the people who survive and whom we have responsibilities to protect, no doubt. Banking practice is probably doing more to make the world, certainly in Europe, but it's not international law in any traditional sense, though it's omnipresent, and Lord knows Basel has failed. Banking is not even mostly law, or alternatively, if you prefer, it's all law, but of oligarchy and beyond the pale of polite discourse, which is going to make liberal presumptions. So to be as clear as I can, I am not saying, in traditional realist fashion, that international law doesn't constrain states who somehow have a pre-existing and unlegally defined stateness. And therefore, international law is not law. I'm not making that old argument. I'm saying that in a bureaucratic, capitalistic, globalized society where Chinese asset bubbles deter US, deter US monetary policy, defined across vast numbers of people at distance, law is everywhere. Think of Delaware corporations, which I also teach. And it's everywhere international. So there's nowhere obvious for a discrete field, the international, to stand. No conceptually independent state, we the people formed into groups, against which international law can imagine itself without vacillating wildly between the actions of tiny elites and relatively small institutions, and a simply unbelievable set of claims to be vaporously the law of international life, that is, of human life. So to quip, globalization has made specifically international law almost undiggable. To put the matter somewhat anthropologically, if we understand law as the formalized understandings of increasingly globalized societies, including states that think of themselves as truly excellent, then international law simply doesn't articulate much of contemporary life. It may indeed be law, but it is at best law at the outer gate. The real law lies deeply. Or to put it polemically, international law is over for the same reason that liberal education is over. The soul of the enterprise lived in a profoundly nationalist liberal Republican imagination of public life. That imagination no longer obtains in the relevant quarters. This too is what postmodern means, or as I said, decadence. So let me conclude. One should take all this with a grain of salt. I don't want to be a downer right before happy hour. I'm like getting really dry here. But something has passed. We won't see another Lincoln or go. And other ways of living together are struggling to be born. So perhaps international law is not the dream that it once was. Perhaps it's a way of organizing moral discourse in a superficially secular way, or at least of justifying the actions of the powerful in more or less populist, if not actually democratic, fashion. Perhaps the university isn't the institution of light and truth, but a jobs program and a place to form identity. And it does create spaces for people to think, sinecures. I certainly appreciate my status, marginal though it is. Turning to politics, elections and such, just maybe we should tend our gardens while amusedly observing our guardians. Self-governance has had a good run, but it has not been the norm during human history. And we do still vote, and it still does mean something. I've overstated the case of the interest of provocation. More importantly, surely life in the city of gold has its pleasures including the ability to communicate so easily with others. So let's be thankful for Weiss. And for the rest, we shall come to know. Thank you. Let us be thankful for something? Weiss and thank you for Bert's talk. I'm reminded that we are transmitting our proceedings around the world. and. I don't know how many viewers, probably don't tell us how many viewers we've had, but in theory, <laughs> and tomorrow I'll talk a little bit about Professor Hilton's project in the 1950s, from 1954 until 1957, the University of the Air, which was a shortwave radio broadcast that, in, you know, given the technology of the time, was every bit like Weiss, that uh, it reached throughout the hemisphere and had potentially hundreds of thousands of listeners every day. So there's that that connection, that tradition that's that's maintained. Uh, questions for Bert, comments? Bert always you always have to kind of sit and think for a while. Digest. John would have you, you have to have a comment. <laughs> okay, we'll start with Anthony. <laughs> Um, think of one, you know. I'm most concerned about the education 
I'm sorry, I have to insist if you don't mind picking the mic from yeah. for the. Will it reach that far? Uh, maybe it'll be easier to bring the mountain to the. Yes. <laughs> we'll bring Mohammed here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Anthony. Uh, so I, uh, I'm uh, alarmed by the idea that the liberal education uh, is grounded in nationalism of the 1880s, and, and uh, that's all passing. Uh, could you say a little bit more about that? A question about how liberal education is grounded in the 1880s and how that is in the nationalism of the 1880s and how that is now passing. I'll pass the mic to Bert. Um, yeah, it's, it's not a very pleasant thought. Um, the, Not to argue from bibliography, but the book I would commend is a book called William Reading's University in Ruins. Um, it, it was he uh, died before it was finished, but it's I think the ending is not quite as good as the critique as is often the case. But um, but it's brilliant. Um, but the basic idea, or maybe another angle to approach it is, is once we start thinking of the university in terms of administration and in terms of assessment. And once we make sort of the divisive, decisive shift from the figure of the professor to the figure of the administrator as the leading figure of the university, then we're doing something profoundly different. And what I would argue we're doing is we're giving up on the notion of cultural authority embodied in the professor, which the professor then has the authority to essentially dictate, to say, this is what you need to know. Now, where did that cultural authority derive from, and why would we pay people to you know, spend their time sitting around thinking about poetry? Um, kids today ask, why should I think about something <laughs> like poetry? Right? And, and so we can see this in things like humanities budgets. So I have a piece coming out about critical issues in qualitative research, right? and I say in vaguely Marxist sort of fashion, the material preconditions for doing the kind of qualitative research that have marked my career um, increasingly exist only as sort of prestige goods among the institutions, right? So we see the sort of move towards uh, the proletization of the uh, of, of of the humanities faculty. We hire a bunch of bad guys, right? So um, I don't I don't think it's going to go away altogether. But the, but the notion that we're going to sort of say this is what you need to learn, and then we'll take care of the rest, uh, relied on a notion of cultural authority that we're unwilling to exert. Right? And we're partly unwilling to exert it because we see our markets now as also, also as global, right? I, mean, I was not joking. I've been involved in international recruitment of students. Right? So, so, the, so it's not accidental that you get Humboldt University in Germany at the beginning of the 19th century, that you get the rise of Johns Hopkins and the transformation of Harvard in the middle of the 19th century. Right? You get the modern form of Cambridge and Oxford. Some of these places are older, right? But yeah, it's bound up in the notion of, of the... Of the the culture which is politically expressed as the nation. That then underwrites it says, okay, this is what it means to be educated, this is what it means to be built. Right? And that, you know, now we have excellence. And excellence is defined essentially competitively. So, you know, how many citations did you get vis-a-vis -vis other people in your field? And we can run a metric on that. And it should contribute to the brand, which we would, would like undying loyalty. It's a different world. Now, I just came from an SEC football game the other day, and I'm starting to say, you know, I've got to sort of make my piece of this. Something else, something else is going on. We can talk about that. It's a start. Uh, Cheeky. Professor Ramirez. Thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting, very provocative. I, I, I read readings years ago, mm -hmm. and, and so I know where you're coming from. Uh, I think you're, you're right about the cultural authority of, of, of the professorial. Yeah. Uh, and in some ways, it's undercut through two different mechanisms. On the one hand, by the rise of what the left calls academic capitalism, you know, when the money keeps rolling in, no one asks questions. It's an original quote from uh, and, uh, <laughs> and on the other hand, the point that the left doesn't deal with is the empowerment of everybody. So the, the cultural authority of the professor presupposes a hierarchy which is undercut when students have rights, uh, staff have rights, junior faculty have rights, and again, all of those things can 
in some ways be seen as good, meaning so, it cuts back on arbitrariness, it cuts back on authoritarianism, but it does have an effect that the professor as this charismatic figure is captured in two things. We line that the professor is no longer the sage on stage, but the guide on the side. I don't know if you've heard that line. I have. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, it, it does capture your I'm point. Gonna, I'm going to appropriate that one. Uh, in, this, in this particular university, it's, it's been a long time since you can do Western seas, and I understand that. And then there was an attempt to do the introduction to the humanities with different cultures. And we now have our, our required seminars that you can pick and choose out of a Chinese menu, and they're called Thinking Matters. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have to say that? <laughs> <laughs> and if you have to say it in, in effect, I also think that the same thing's happening to the nation state, which is, yes, you're right, that there was a big moment of excitement, you were going to be post-national, and especially in Europe, given the horrors of World War II. And now uh, we proceeded, but I think the, the nation state has lost some of its charisma. I actually think it's a good thing. It's there. It's not going away. But I bet you if you actually do surveys of how many people are willing to die for their country? The numbers go down, which is to say the state is not seen as charismatic. Right. Right. It, 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 I, I think I, I basically agree with that. One way of thinking about this is um, is I'm starting to think about what some of uh, my, my, my first big book was a partial defense of global capitalism, right? So I said, why is this appealing? Why is it successful? And, and, and those were sort of the reasons, right? What I'm now thinking through with a bit more care um, is, are some of the costs. Um, and um, yeah, so entire notions, I think, of, of sort of uh, self-governance, entire notions of education, um, have an entire notion of cultural capital, right? Have hinged on ideas that we can no longer publicly defend, and defending them in terms of, and you know, I, I kind of I know a bit about capitalism. <laughs> defending them in terms of capitalism, which is what great universities end up doing right now, is not particularly appealing either, right? <laughs> so what you end up with, I think, is a kind of. Uh, Discourse in quasi bad faith. Um, this may be just the jadedness of turning 50, but I don't think so. <laughs> Other questions? And Professor Ramirez will be talking about these topics and more the hegemony of higher education, particularly the, the Stanford case in this talk tomorrow afternoon. So, yes, Tim? Just a couple of thoughts. One of the things that's got my attention recently is the studies of the center. Yes, Francisco. Uh, for those who are arguing that the state might be on the way out, I wonder why, why is that we're fighting in the Middle East? Why does ISIS start to fall? Um, the claim is not that the state, or for that matter, the university is on the way out, right? The claim is that they're carrying different types of meaning, right? So, uh, so with regard to the state, uh, Fukuyama's argument, which I think is a 
didn't do very well in this forum, but if you actually go back and read it, it's, um, it's, it's quite solid. He says, a certain form of liberalism dominates political discourse. It has no real contenders. Now, I argued at the time, actually, because that way it was kind of a fling with Islamic law. Um, I argued at the time that, that, that maybe Islam was an external discourse that could sort of fill the epistemological role that had been abandoned by Marxism. Sorry, John. Um, but be that as it may, at least in among sort of the New York Times readership, there really isn't an imaginative, a serious intellectual space outside the purview of the received ideas, right? So, in that sense, the state as as is is, is terribly secure, right? And I would say similar things about graduate education, right? I got kids in not this elite university, but a different one. Um, <laughs> Right? And so, yeah, I'm all about it, right? The university's probably never been more important to any society than it is to this one. But, I'm not convinced. <laughs> that said, the question is how do we think the university? And my point here is the university was thought in terms of meanings and significance it's that it now does not have available to it, right? And so it has to, it has to prove itself in ways that I'm quite familiar with uh, because I teach business. Right, right, and that's different. It's a little hard to get as excited about it, right? So it's not that the institutions are going away. The question is the instant is the question is our feelings or stances towards the institution. How seriously do we take the institutions? So yes, would you die for it, right? How seriously do you take, you know, the notion that the university is something that is in some sense sacred? It's getting harder to say that, and I grew up saying that in some way. Right? And so, and so, similar things about elections, right? I, 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 I frequently berate my children and my students about being, about an easy cynicism, right? But it's difficult to combat that, right? So, so the, the task at present, I think, is partially to have a, is that I, I'm not, I, I, this talk probably came off as more normative than I intended it to. Um, the task at present, I think, is to sort of figure out, okay, we've got these institutions that we seem to be psychologically reinventing. What does that actually mean? And it doesn't mean what we say it means, because what we say it means is inherited and we're not believing that anymore. That's my, that's my primary contention. Right. John? I'm not sure um, this is going to be very uh, articulate. <laughs> But the, the question that arises for me is how do we think, so if I understood it correctly, you, the, our, the way we think about the state is, is premised upon a certain political, philosophical foundation of liberal, republican voting, and so on. But, There is an actor that, to me, and at least, and I think many people, remains rather amorphous, that is supranational, multilateral, um, and that plays across the realm of states, seems to have uh, effects on states and countries and economies. Um, and there is a resistance to that actor that is emerging across states and with um, <coughs> but the target does not seem very clear for what that resistance is approaching. Um, so I think one of the questions that arises for me is in this moment, how do we think about state as an arena of some kind of contestation or not? Um, I, I think it is probably wrong to think about most of the things that you want to think about in terms of actors. Um, I think we have a lot more things that are better thought of in terms of 
phrase I've used elsewhere is present situations. Right? Um, so there is a tendency running through leftist law in particular to um, it's oddly fetishize historical forces and then take stances vis a vis them. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, a, 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 a classic error in a way, but committed in a different fashion, right? So, um, so for example, uh, demonizing the WTO, just to take a, an example, right, doesn't get one very far. Um, or the IMF, a buddy of mine is in charge of fiscal responsibility at the IMF. Um, the question becomes, or if we're looking at the global financial crisis, right? The question becomes understanding these uh, crises or historical moments in terms of um, systems of thought, in terms of uh, systems of interest that are more or less attractive for a variety of reasons, and then the interactions among those, right? So it's an awful lot more like theater than it is like an actor. Right? And then understanding the theater has to do with understanding character. So, so why did we think what we thought about the ability of banks to self-regulate? Well, yeah. there are things to say about that. Right? There were several generations of work in finance um, led us to believe we were really good at, pro at uh, pricing risk. It led us to believe we had the structural capacity not only to, to price risk but to spread it. And let us to believe that the government wouldn't do things correctly and should get out of the way. And we can kind of go down a, a sort of litany of ideas that in hindsight are bad. Um, and that if powerful people at powerful institutions simultaneously believe, this begins to sound like a run up to World War I kind of argument, right? <laughs> Given this, this, and this, and this, and this, suddenly you get a structure that, that, that you know, <laughs> If the, if the cookie crumbles correctly, it can lead to disaster. But it's not given an overarching or particularly conscious um, space. And that gets to be very hard. I mean, it's what, it's what I do, but it's, but it's very hard and oftentimes somewhat, un, somewhat unsatisfying. Right? Um, so that's a very partial answer. But just at least in terms of my own work, I spend a lot of time saying, okay, why do people think this? There's got to be a reason they think this. Right? I may disagree. Um, so that's something else I'm trying to teach, right? Be sympathetic first, critical later. Final question from Roman. What do you think about the uh, book uh, on globalization by Thomas Friedman? I only read my own books on globalization. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if, if uh, what he wrote, I think the book came out about five years ago, uh, what he wrote there, it makes it, I mean, it's a classic, right? Um, the world is flat. Yeah. And <laughs> if, if it still holds true or will hold true. Well, it's a little hard to stand at Stanford and say the world's flat. I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm, I, is it dinner time? It's happy hour. It's happy hour. So, <laughs> <laughs>